special edition. We're marking 30 years of cracking crime on BBC One. All it takes is one call to Crime Watch. A young woman raped by two men in a crowded field. I was just <laughs> screaming, help, get off me. I screamed as loud as I could. A 14-year-old girl vanished. Um, the last two weeks have been heartbreaking. Every minute we're thinking about her and wondering what might have happened. Tonight, police need you to trace this man. And 30 years of cracking cases. The object was pure public service broadcasting. I mean, it really was. Let's see if we can do something to help cut crime. Catching the criminals, protecting the public. This is Crime Watch. And welcome to Crime Watch. We are live for the next hour with the latest crime investigations, news and appeals. There are dozens of detectives in the studio from across the country, all counting on you to help solve their cases. Including an incredibly violent raid on a family home in Kent. Where's the shot? There's three young, fit um, blokes. All they had to say was, don't move. You know, if you do move, we will hit you. But they never gave us the option. And I'll have my latest collection of faces, including this man, who's wanted in connection with an incident in which a stolen BMW was deliberately driven at a man outside a Bournemouth nightclub. And marking three decades of Crime Watch, we'll be going back to meet some of the victims and survivors from our biggest appeals to see how their lives have changed. The moment I knew that Josie was alive, suddenly it sort of changes everything. You think, right, you've got to be there for her. I haven't forgotten about the past. I know how life used to be, but yeah, I have to think positive and don't dwell about it. Now, motorsport is hugely popular across the country, but if you aren't a fan, you might not realise that many race meets are more like, well, like mini festivals, really, with music, fun fairs and overnight camping. The vast majority of people have a great time, of course, but tonight we need your help to catch not one but two rapists who attacked a young woman at an event this summer. This is the Santa Pod Raceway, the home of British drag racing. A former American airbase on the outskirts of Northampton. They've been racing cars here since the 60s. These days, it attracts a family crowd to all sorts of events, including the annual Drag Stouger meet held this year over a weekend in July. The Drag Stouger event is dedicated to classic drag racing and hot rod cars. This summer, it drew thousands of spectators from all over the country, with many camping the whole weekend. One local woman was there to enjoy the day while her friend worked on site. I'm not a massive fan of drag racing, but as my friend was there working, I decided I'd join them. I watched the racing from the top of the hill. Most people were up at the track because obviously the cars were, were doing their burnouts. As the day's racing came to an end, she made her way here to this busy bar area to spend some time with her friend. At about 9 o'clock, she started chatting to a familiar face, a man she knew as Darren, and his friend, Pablo. The bar was very busy. Darren and Pablo started talking. Darren said he was getting married in two weeks' time, and they were all having a good time. After a while, Darren's friends disappeared, leaving the two of them chatting. I've met Darren before up there. He's not a friend or anything. I've seen him there before with his family. Around 1 a.m., the bar was starting to close. Are you sure you know the way? <laughs> I don't know why you can't remember the way. Because Darren couldn't remember where his tent was, 
She walked with him to the campsite to try and help him find it. Their route took them through the fairground area, which was now closed. We were looking. We must have been looking for about 15 minutes. It was pitch black. And I was using the torch on my phone. It better be this one, because I want to go and zip it. Oh, we got to his tent, and he sort of stumbled a little bit. I asked him if he was all right. He said, yeah, he was going to go to sleep now, and I said, OK. I zipped the tent back up and left. As she went to find her way back to the bar, she became disorientated in the darkness. I still, I sort of stood there for a second. I knew, like, if I'd walk up towards the main gate, I'd know where I was. I would have been not even two minutes away. I sort of stumbled, then I had this pain in the back of my head, like someone had just ripped out my hair. I was just screaming, help, get off me. I screamed as loud as I could. One of them ripped my clothes off, while the other one pinned me down. <laughs> and then he raped me. <laughs> he then held me down while the other man raped me. So, Jerry, this is the field where the attack took place. This field was actually full of tents uh, on the day in question. It was heaving, they were packed in quite tight. There was caravans, camper vans. There was 4,000 race vans here. So, for the victim, making her way through this field, she may not have felt threatened, just felt, that, OK, she was a bit lost, but what route would she have taken? And she would have felt fairly safe. You don't have to go too far for her to be in an area where it would have been completely pitch black. No, she started uh, coming down from over there and wandered through the middle of the field, coming down and round, and we believe Darren's tent was somewhere in this area over here. She then st uh, lost her bearings a little bit and was making her way back to the main bar area up there where she had come from. Because of the noise, because of all the comings and goings, people wouldn't have realised, possibly, that the noises they may have heard were the noises of an attack. Well, witnesses have already told us that there were a lot of people that night. It was a warm night. People were out sitting around fires, sitting around barbecues, generally enjoying themselves, but there was a, a reasonable amount of noise. So a scream may not have been heard and may just have filtered into the background of all the other noise that was being made that evening. I don't leave my house by myself. I get, like, really bad night terrors, and my partner has to wake me up every night just to, like, to make me realise that I am at home and I am safe. I shouldn't have to hide away. If they were caught, I'd feel safe. I'd be able to leave my house without anyone holding my hand. If they were caught, well, let's try and catch them tonight. Detective Inspector Jerry Waite from Bedfordshire Police is here with us in the studio. I think it's very important to just let viewers at home know that this uh, young fellow, Darren, that was helped back to his tent, and his friends are considered vital witnesses and not suspects here. They certainly are. Darren and his group are vital witnesses to the investigation. The group were out on Darren's stag night. He was getting married a fortnight later. He's uh, a man with 16 digits in his surname, so he's quite unique. And his friend Pablo is a unique name as well, but they are vital witnesses who we really need to trace. There were loads of other people there, of course, and presumably you want to hear from them tonight. We do. There were several thousand people there. They may have heard or seen something. They may not even realise what they were looking at, but they could be vital witnesses to us. OK, Jerry, let's just focus in now on what we know. Let's take a look at the locale and the particular areas you're interested in. Yeah. Um, Santapod is on the Bedfordshire-Northamptonshire border, and it obviously is a big racing venue. Uh, the victim walked through the fair from the bar area into a field. Now, 
we need to trace exactly where in that field Darren's tent was, because that'll help us locate where the scene of this crime was. You're looking for a particular car as well. Tell us a bit about that. We certainly are. We're looking for a one-series black BMW with purple wheels. It's quite a unique vehicle. But uh, it was on the site from 8 o'clock, uh, from 6 o'clock on Saturday night, and it left at half past 8 on Sunday morning. The people in that vehicle are vital to our inquiries, and we'd like them to come forward as well. You found leggings, an important piece of evidence. We did. We found the victim's leggings in a black bin bag that was in a skip. What we don't know is how they got into that bin bag. And if someone put them in there, we'd like that person to come forward and let us know where they found those leggings. OK, thanks very much for updating us on all of that. If you can help, you know what to do. You need to call us. The studio number is 0500 600 600. If indeed you've got any photos or video of the event, if you were there, there's a special email address to send that to as well. All the details, of course, you'll find on our website. Let's go to, uh, to Martin. We start on Wanted Faces tonight with Dean Cambridge. This mobile phone footage shows a stolen grey BMW estate being deliberately driven into a man in Bournemouth three weeks ago. Police believe that the man driving that car was 32-year-old Cambridge, who's also known as Dean Stevens. He has links with Dorset, Surrey, Kent and London. Fortunately, the victim escaped without serious injury. Next is Salah Hadi who's also known as Salam Hadi Ali. Officers want to speak to him in connection with the attempted murder of a man during which the victim was slashed across his face and neck. 35-year-old Hadi, who's Kurdish, has links to Norwich, Ipswich and the West Midlands. He's considered to be dangerous, so if you see him, don't approach him. Just call 999 immediately. Number three is Adam Lawrence. The 42-year-old is wanted on a recall to prison after breaching the terms of his licence. He was originally sentenced to 12 years for armed robbery. Lawrence has links to the Dagenham and Romford areas of London and is known as Wingnut because of his distinctive ears. However, don't be fooled, he's considered dangerous. So if you see him or know where he is, call the police straight away. And lastly, for now, is Stanislav Pignor, who's also known just as Stan. Detectives need to trace him in connection with a fraud which saw more than a dozen victims conned out of more than £200,000. The 45-year-old, who's originally from Poland, has connections in Oxfordshire and Berkshire, but is known to travel all over the country. He's a big lad at six foot three and has tattoos all over his back and arms. Now, all of the faces on the website, and if you know where they are, call and text the numbers on screen. Texts will be charged at your standard message rate. Just over a fortnight ago, 14-year-old Alice Gross spent the morning with her mum before heading out for a walk near her West London home. Apart from some grainy CCTV images taken that day, she has not been seen since. As you'd expect, Alice's family are extremely worried. Uh, the last two weeks have been completely heartbreaking. Um, there's not a moment of the day that you don't think about Alice and where she is, what might have happened or why she might have gone missing. It's almost impossible to describe what that pain feels like, but we just want her to know, please, Alice, if you're out there, come home. And if anyone has any information at all about her movements on that day or about her whereabouts now, I just really plead with them to come forward to the police and get her home, because that's where she belongs and she needs to be here with us. So worrying. Well, DCI Andy Chalmers from the Met is here, leading the investigation. Um, what has happened to Alice, it would be fair to say, is a complete mystery. It is first and foremost a missing person inquiry, but obviously the longer that Alice remains missing, the greater our concerns. What do you know for definite? Well, what we do know is that just after one o'clock on Thursday, the 28th of August, she left her home alone to go for a walk along the Grand Union Canal, which was a normal activity. Can you just in detail talk us through that, that route then? Tell us where she went and when. Surely she left her home in Hanwell, which is up here. She followed the Grand Union Canal down to Brentford, which is where we believe she may have shopped. She then returned back along the same route. The last confirmed sighting we have is at the bridge at Trumpers Way at 26 minutes past four. We don't know where she went thereafter. I'm keen to speak to anyone that might have seen her. OK. You've got uh, important bits of CCTV footage from throughout that walking journey. Just take us through those, would you? We do. This is Hanwell Station near her home. She walks past alone. You can see she's wearing slim-fit blue jeans right. and a dark grey T-shirt. OK. 
And no. This is in the Uxbridge Road. She's got her blue vans on. And in the next clip, you'll see slightly further along the road, she's got her black multicoloured rucksack on. This is down at Brentford Lock at about quarter past two. 45 minutes later, she texted her father to see what time he was going to be home. That's the last contact she had with her family. Um, there is somebody, there is a man that you are very keen to trace. What more information can you give us about that tonight? Yes, this is 41-year-old Arnis Salkans. He went missing seven days later from the same area. What we do know is that in the early morning of the 4th of September, he left home to go to work on his red mountain bike. He hasn't been seen since, but his normal route would have been along the part of the canal that Alice went missing on. There's no suggestion that he knew Alice, but clearly he's someone I need to speak to. He might have very important information. I should let people know there are five other cyclists, a group of three, I think, and a group of two who were also on the towpath that day. Um, again, you know they were there, but you need them to come forward so you can identify them. I do. It was a very busy time on the towpath. Um, Alice's possessions, you, you found some stuff. Five days later, we found her bag. This is an image of it here. It was on the bank of the River Brent between the Hanwell Bridge and the canal. It contained her lunchbox and her shoes, but importantly, not her iPhone. I'm keen to speak to anyone who may have seen that bag. Um, yes, not the iPhone. I mean, that is absolutely crucial. Tell us more about this iPhone that's still missing. The iPhone is a white 4S. It's unique in that it had a cracked rear case in which Alice had coloured in. Um, she was in connection with the internet throughout her walk, but it went off air at about 5pm and hasn't been used since. I'm keen to speak to anyone who may have possession of this iPhone. I'm not concerned how they came into possession of it, I just need the phone. Yes, and the reason you need that phone, of course, is because of who she might have been speaking to, you know, online on the phone. Exactly. Alice's internet history is a very important line of inquiry. I need to speak to anyone who may have spoken to her through chat rooms or media sites. OK, DCI Andy Chalmers for now. Thank you very much indeed. If you can help with this search for Alice in any way, I would urge you please to get in touch on the usual numbers. A roundup of the latest crime news now, starting with the murders of two British tourists in Thailand. David Miller, 24, and Hannah Withridge, 23, were found dead on a beach on Monday, having suffered serious injuries in an attack. Now, Thai police have released a CCTV image of what they describe as an Asian-looking man who they want to trace. Well, today, the families of both victims paid tribute to them. Now, a have-a-go hero has foiled a daring jewellery raid by snatching more than half the loot as the gang fled. The quick-thinking customer was at Selective Gold in Birmingham on the 26th of August when the four masked men with sledgehammers struck. The bag the hero snatched back contained an estimated £50,000 worth of stock, though the robber still got away with around 30 grand's worth. Police want to trace the five offenders who pulled up outside the jewellers in a stolen silver Audi RS with false plates. Now, if you can help, officers investigating the case are in the studio, ready for your call. Finally, a heroic teenager has been given an award for his bravery after helping officers restrain an arrested man when he became violent. 16-year-old Kai Ingham stepped in when he saw the two officers struggling with Bradley J. Hughes, who was trying to make a getaway, tackling him to the ground. Now, Hughes later pleaded guilty to assaulting a police officer. So, 30 Years of Crime Watch, Britain's biggest and longest-running crime show, has featured almost, would you believe it, 5,000 appeals in that time from every single UK police force. Amazingly, thanks to information from you at home, around one in three of the appeals leads to an arrest and one in five to a conviction. Impressive stuff. You can help stop crime. It's a programme embedded in Britain's consciousness. Tonight, once again, we're asking for your help. It's put hundreds of criminals behind bars. Number two here is a nasty piece of work. Given justice to victims and their families. We've had a phenomenal response. And it's been on air for 30 years. This is Crime Watch. For three decades, viewers and police have been working together. The vital clue which you can help with are these overalls. Susie Lamplew, James Bulger, Stephen Lawrence, Millie Dowler. We featured the high-profile crimes that have shocked the nation. And thanks to you, hundreds of investigations have been solved. 10, 9, 8, 
The object was pure public service broadcasting. I mean, it really was. Let's see if we could do something to help cut crime. This is about real-life crime, not the stuff of fiction. The first show wasn't without its fair share of setbacks. We walked down to the studio and all the set was in kit form on the floor. Splits of wood, nails, hammers, mallets. With 15 minutes to go, the controller of BBC One, Bill Cotton, came down onto the set and he said, you've got to get on the air. And eventually, in the earpiece, we're on. Clear, clear the set, everybody, clear the set. <laughs> Five, four, three, two, one. We were off. You may find some details disturbing, but they'll only... Be... Crime Watch finally made it on air on the 7th of June, 1984. If you see anything tonight that jogged your memory, please call us. We hope to see immediate results. We suddenly thought, what if nobody rings? I mean, it was about 20 minutes in, and I looked around, thank God. <laughs> There's a phone going. With its mix of reconstructions, studio appeals, and items about investigative techniques, viewers were instantly hooked. Meanwhile, don't have nightmares. And we were off and running. In fact, the lines were jammed by the end of the programme, and they had to double the lines for the next month. Soon, all police forces were coming to Crime Watch with their most serious cases. And the programme was yielding results. And any identifications of the car that night? Yes, several calls from people who... CCTV, e-fits and artist impressions were shown to jog viewers' memories. With millions of people watching, officers realised they could speak directly to key witnesses. An early success was the conviction of the man who murdered Julie Dart and kidnapped Stephanie Slater. Crime Watch called on the public to help piece a number of clues together. This time, police had more than artists' impressions to go on. His ransom demand had been recorded. For the first time, you can now hear what he sounds like. Have you got the money? Who's this, please? Never mind. Have you got the money? Investigators in the studio were given a name. Michael Sams is in jail tonight, starting four life sentences for murdering the Leeds teenager Julie Dart and kidnapping Stephanie Slater. By now, the programme was a recognised tool in solving crime. Presenters changed and the style of the show evolved, but the core values remained the same. Good evening. Tonight, we have Josie Russell's story. Go back 20 years to a murder case. Nine arrests since last month, all as a direct result of viewers' calls. Jill Dando joined in 1995 and over the next four years was a much-loved member of the team. Good evening. A massive police hunt is underway tonight in West London for the killer of Jill Dando, who was murdered earlier today outside her terraced home in Fulham. This is a, a sombre and, for me, a surreal Crime Watch UK. For all of us here, it can be gruelling coping with crimes against victims who are strangers. It's been almost unbearable dealing with Jill's death. I mean, shock isn't quite the word. I mean, it, to, and then the idea that she'd been murdered was was almost incomprehensible. The whole team was in a state of of trauma. We didn't dare hope, but we've had a phenomenal response on the Sarah Payne case. Something like two hundred calls. Reconstructions can be a powerful way of telling viewers about the victims and events leading up to a crime. They can also reach out to people who may not have otherwise come forward with information. When seven-year-old Tony Ann Byfield was killed in a gangland shooting, police asked Crime Watch to broadcast an appeal. You look nice, you look really nice. And what we were trying to do was pull some emotional heartstrings and say, enough is enough. It's time for bed, you know. But you want more information about an incident that happened 
a seven-year-old girl being murdered in London in gang-related crime, being shot and executed, has got to be something that the community wants to come forward and deal with. As a result of calls made to the programme, Joel Smith was jailed for life for murder. I'm absolutely convinced to this day that if it hadn't been for Crime Watch, that case would never have been solved. In another shocking case, Danilo Restivo brutally murdered mother of two, Heather Barnett. The reconstruction gathered important evidence. It's not until you go on Crime Watch that you suddenly, you know, suddenly we were getting 500 people coming forward to give information. 15-year-old Mo Borner was left with severe brain damage after he was attacked during a night out with friends. He's been making a slow but determined recovery since. It's been emotional. I woke up on a hospital bed. The investigation had stalled to all intents and purposes and we were short of some um, important and vital evidence. We made a decision to approach Crime Watch to see how they could help. Several callers got in touch to name Mo's attacker as Ashley da Costa. He was convicted of a racially motivated assault. Well, obviously, without a conviction for us, it would have just left so many open, raw wounds that you can actually make a huge difference through watching Crime Watch and through reporting anything back to them that you feel might be relevant to the case. People wanted for murder, robbery and kidnap. A case that has really made the headlines this month, the murder of Melanie Hall. This is a scene. Take your time. She was barely visible and had lain unseen for several days. Crime Watch is now such an institution, it regularly makes the news. They've been filming for Crime Watch, focused on that supermarket. That's where Jo Yates stopped on her way home on the night she disappeared. And when the Metropolitan Police asked us to put together an appeal on the Madeleine McCann case, the headlines spread all over the world. They'll be asking the British public for help tomorrow night. Aired on BBC's Crime Here Watch. Here on Britain's version of America's Most Wanted. BBC that... Crime Watch reconstruction. Of the... This case has, um, over the years since Madeleine disappeared, has been the subject of intense media coverage. And some of that coverage has not been factually accurate. We had the opportunity to carefully piece together the timeline in terms of the information and evidence that we'd accumulated. And then to be able to reach out to the public, helping them to really that moment and let's focus on 10 p.m. let's focus on this sighting and you tell me what's important and what people watching on the night of the of the television broadcast on crime watch it was an unprecedented event for us you know the public watched the program in their millions and they called into the show in their thousands and in amongst all of that information we got some really interesting leads well, on the day that the program went out we were actually in the studios so we were able to witness a lot of the calls coming in, and as soon as the appeal started, the phones were ringing. I was quite surprised after the length of time, six and a half years and multiple appeals, you think, you know, can we get anything more? But clearly the format of the programme, the way the information was delivered, meant people who had really relevant information came forward. After 30 years and 320 programmes, Crime Watch has featured more than 4,500 cases. So how is the show put together? Wherever possible, filming takes place in the actual locations where crimes have happened. Well, there's nothing more important than having accuracy in the reconstructions. They have got to be as close as possible to what we think are the facts of the case. On the day of the broadcast, officers are briefed on all the cases. 
there may be 40 or 50 different pieces of, um, of appeal that are going out throughout the show. Each of the leads for the cases gets to stand in front of the rest of the, the police and crime watch team and just give a little bit more detail about what it is precisely that the, that the investigating officer is looking for and that's a really important element of the, of the show itself. As soon as the show begins, the phones are live. It's always astonishing how quickly the phones start ringing in the studio. Time and time again, it's a formula that works. Dangerous criminals are behind bars. And thanks to you, Britain is a safer place. Truly remarkable, and as Matthew said, they're all thanks to your calls. And we still need your help, this time with a brutal burglary at a family home in Kent. Three blokes. Balaclavas, a baseball bat, and they had a sledgehammer. Well, that's coming very soon, but first, Martin has his latest batch of CCTV. Yes, yeah, so we start with a pair of chances trying their luck in an amusement arcade. It's very early on a Saturday morning in February, and this rather acrobatic chap is making his way carefully into the back corridor of an amusement arcade in Crawley in Sussex after sawing a hole in the ceiling. And he's not alone. With his equally agile friend joining him a few moments later. Armed with a torch, the pair make their way into the main arcade area, crawling along the floor to avoid the motion sensors. It's a shame for them they weren't so diligent when it came to the security cameras, which capture their every move. They set about the machines, jimming them open and emptying the cash boxes. They systematically work their way around the arcade, netting themselves more than 40 grand in the process. When they're done, they crawl back the way they came, leaving through the hole in the roof where police believe a third man had been keeping watch. Now it's odds on that someone recognizes these chances, so don't take the gamble. If you know them, tell us who they are tonight. Inside the Halifax Bank in Blackburn Town Centre on a Tuesday afternoon in May. A man is being served at the counter. He's withdrawing several thousand pounds in cash, which the bank clerk gives him in a white envelope. Little does he know he's being watched intently by two women, one in a bobble hat and one in a dark coat, who appear to be queuing. When he leaves the bank, the women follow just a few seconds behind. They stay close to him as he walks through a nearby shopping centre. And when he enters WH Smith's, the younger woman makes her move, slipping her hand into his pocket and grabbing the envelope before hurrying off. The police know the older woman is called Stoyana Drumitru, but they need you to name her bobble-hatted sidekick and to tell us where they both are. A man wearing pale trousers and a leather jacket walks into the O2 shop in High Road, North London on a Friday morning in March, shortly followed by a guy in ripped blue jeans. The pair walk over to the display and start to fiddle with the handsets. They seem to be under the impression that this is a takeaway. Watch as one of them prizes a phone off its stand. He then joins his mate and together they take another one. The guy in the blue jeans casually slipping it into his pocket before they leave. That day, they took three handsets worth £1,300, and police are linking them to at least 17 other jobs. Give us a call and name these sneaky phone thieves tonight. If you need another look, all the CCTV is on the website. Call and text the numbers on screen if you can help. Calls are free from most landlines. Some networks and mobile operators will charge. Now, just take a look at these uh, photographs here. They're, they're not easy to look at. They, they show the horrific injuries inflicted on a husband and wife by a gang who raided their home late one night. Without warning, the thugs battered the couple using baseball bats and hammers. This dangerous gang needs to be caught tonight before they kill someone. I can still picture them. 
hitting my husband. All they had to say was don't move, but they never gave us the option. Those 10 to 15 minutes has changed our life forever. Where's the sun? This is where we've lived for a long time, where, you know, we've entertained, you know, I, our daughter's grown up here. It was our palace, really. Open countryside, a house we always dreamt of, and we worked hard for it, and we made it our home. Well, I got home a bit earlier from work, so late afternoon. We thought rather than just sitting, you know, we went to, out for a walk, just before seven. We had our dinner and um, uh, we sat and watched telly and um, we went to bed about just before ten. and I thought it was a car accident outside. Within the seconds, I heard the voices, the people walking around. In about 30 seconds, and they were upstairs. Where's the sun? First thing I remember is being struck across the place. <laughs> Three blokes, balaclavas, a baseball bat, and they had a sledgehammer. They didn't demand anything at first, they hit us. My teeth fell out and, and the jaw was broken. At one point I thought I was going to lose my husband. Other than that, my mind was numb. There was one chap who was the leader, if you like, and he was the one that um, did most of the physical damage to myself and my wife. One guy who was going through the cupboards, I could see from the corner of my eye. And the other one was asking me, is gold, money, sir? Where's the money? And he said repeatedly, two or three times. And before I could answer anything, he was at the, they'd found the safe. I don't remember actually coming downstairs, but I tried to dial 999. I dialed the first digit, but then blood was pouring so much. <laughs> then my wife actually took the phone from me. What's happened? Whoa, we've been gargled. Sorry? We're coming. They've hit us. They've broken into our house. They've broken into your house? We're both bleeding, my husband and myself. I had a fracture, multiple fractures on my side of the face and eyes. And side of the face, I still have no feeling. Some of the feeling may take 18 months or may never come back. They um, uh, cracked my eye socket, my cheekbone, and they broke my jaw. My nose is broken. Uh, this eye is, is not reacting as fast as it should be so I can't read properly. There's three young, fit um, blokes. I mean, what am I going to do <clears throat> in terms of threatening them? And all they had to say was, don't move. You know, if you do move, we will hit you. But they never gave us the option. There was no need for it. If they had asked me, I'd probably hand it over to them. You can't put price on a life. Just disgraceful. Well, if you want to get in touch with any information on this particular crime, I should tell you right now that we've had to change our numbers tonight. We're having a few problems with the phone lines. So this is the Crime Watch number tonight. For this or any other case you want to get in touch on, it's 02920 
83864. That's 02920 838640. And I should let you know that texts and emails are working on the same addresses as normal. Well, DS Richard Spicer from Kent Police uh, joins me now. Jazz sum summed it up there in the film, didn't he, by saying that there was no sense in which these guys needed to use this amount of violence to get what they wanted. No, that's right, Kirsty. It was completely unnecessary. The uh, injuries that they sustained were horrific. Um, what we can say from what the couple tell us is that one person did seem to be a lot more violent than the other two. Right. And his actions may indeed have shocked the others that were with him. Uh, they say that one of them was dark-skinned with a foreign accent and the other two had local accents. What did they get away with? They took some distinctive items. They had a number of Asian gold pieces, one of which was identical to this bracelet. Um, it also had a circular pendant with the letter R on it. They took personal documents as well, including passports in the name of the victims, which were Jaswant, uh, Upal and Colbeer or Paul. Right. Did they, was there a getaway car? Any idea how they made their escape? We assume that they had a car. Uh, on the map here, you can see that it's quite a remote area. It's very rural, so we uh, wouldn't thought that they would have got away on foot. So we really would urge anyone in that area, particularly High Cross Road in South Fleet, uh, that saw any suspicious vehicles parked or unattended around that area, to give us a call. Particularly horrific attack and presumably, you know, very long-lasting effect this is going to have. Yeah, it's good to see that they're recovering now, but it's going to be long-lasting emotionally and physically for them. Uh, as I say, it was an awful attack on them. Uh, very briefly, there's a reward? Yes, uh, £5,000 for anyone that can give us positive information that leads to the arrest. OK. Richard, thanks very much for now. Well, with your help, hopefully we can get these thugs, because that's what they are, behind bars, where they belong. Please do call Richard and his team now in the studio. Let me give you that number again. It's 02920 Or, of course, you can speak anonymously to Crime Stoppers. They're on 0800 555 one And if you yourself have been a victim of crime, there's the victim support line. Let me give you their number, too. 0845 30 30 900. More faces, starting this time with Sarbaz Ali. Detectives need to trace him after he did a runner from Hove Crown Court a fortnight ago during a lunch break. The 28-year-old was then convicted in his absence of the rape and sexual assault of a man in Hastings in February 2013. Ali is originally from Iraq, but has links to Burton-on-Trent and Newark and may well be working as a barber or in fast-food restaurants. Next is Martin Casey. He absconded from HMP Sudbury in April, where he was serving an eight-and-a-half-year sentence for causing death by dangerous driving. Casey was responsible for the death of 50-year-old father of two, Major Richard Angove, in 2011. 29-year-old Casey has a number of tattoos, including a cobra and the name Popeye, with RIP and 26072011 on his right arm and Martin and a dagger on his back. He has links to Leicestershire and Swansea and is considered to be dangerous, so should not be approached. Finally, we have this pair, Mark Daly and Carol Cannon. Police want to speak to them about a burglary in which more than £20,000 worth of jewellery and property was stolen. They're a couple, so they're likely to be together. 43-year-old Daly, who has links to Coventry and Leeds, has a large tattoo on his back with the names Lucas and Johnny in a jigsaw pattern, whereas 48-year-old Canham has links to Beverly in East Yorkshire and Alicante in Spain. She's described as having a Yorkshire accent. Call and text all the usual numbers if you recognise any of tonight's faces. And, of course, they're all online. Now, still to come, living with murder, a father talks about the moment that he came face to face with the man who killed his daughter. I went to the uh, magistrate's court and I heard a lock open like a big slide bolt. And then I heard footsteps on the stairs and I knew that it was him. I couldn't breathe, I couldn't see, I couldn't think. It was an absolute psychological breakdown. But first, time for some updates on previous cases. We've heard just a sample of some of the great results you've helped deliver down the years tonight. So let's bring you up to date with the very latest, starting with a case we featured last year. 27-year-old trainee accountant Atif Ali. Now, he was shot as he drove to work in Luton in May 2013. He suffered a serious injury to his leg and almost died. 
Well, in the last few weeks, three men have been found guilty of attacking Atif. They were all convicted of conspiracy to murder and given hefty jail sentences. The court heard that one of them, 28-year-old Shazad Marouf, had arranged the shooting because he wanted a relationship with the victim's girlfriend. Next, Dean Smart, who was on the board back in March. Uh, police needed to find him after an extremely violent robbery at a holiday park in Devon, during which the victims were attacked with hammers and an axe. Well, after his face was shown on Crime Watch, he was located in Bath, arrested and charged. Last month, 27-year-old Smart was sentenced to eight years in prison. Great stuff. Finally, we have Howard Blackman. There he is. Uh, he was wanted for a variety of offences, including drug dealing, money laundering, and he'd been on the run for eight months. Well, after our appeal, detectives received a tip-off and he was found in Southwark in London. Last month, he was sentenced to five years and three months in prison. He'll be deported when he served that sentence. Fantastic, and yet more evidence of what a difference your calls really do make. Now, we often get phone thieves caught on CCTV, but this first pair have taken things to the extreme by nicking mobiles worth almost £200,000. A man who might be wearing a wig and his mate, who definitely isn't, walked through the security gate of a mobile phone factory in Ashford in Kent on a Thursday evening in June. The white jackets the pair are wearing are very similar to the uniform worn by the factory workers, enabling them to walk around unchallenged. They make their way onto the factory floor before entering the manager's office. While inside, they fill up two holdalls full of the latest models of mobile phones. They casually stroll off with their loot before leaving via a fire escape. They nick phones worth up to £200,000. Pick up yours and tell us who they are tonight. <laughs> A stocky man in a grey and white rip curl hoodie walks into the Barclays Bank in Bushy in Hertfordshire on a Monday afternoon in April. He strides straight up to the counter where he hands the cashier a green Marks and Spencers bag and a note demanding thousands of pounds. The woman tries to stall for time, but the man threatens her, so she fills the bag and hands it over. He then leaves quickly, walking off up the high street. This man stole a lot of money and threatened to hurt a female bank worker. Who is he? This is the backyard of the Grandstand restaurant near Newton Abbott Racecourse early on a Monday morning in May. Now, it was a bank holiday, but as they say, it seems there's no rest for the wicked. As a man wearing a dark hoodie, gloves and a clown mask climbs over the wall and into the courtyard. He finds an open door and makes his way inside. He has a wander around where he comes across two female members of staff who were preparing for breakfast. He marches them towards the manager's office, waving a large knife around as he does. He demands they open it, but the women explain they don't have the keys. The knife man then orders them back to the restaurant area where one of the women is able to run off to raise the alarm. The thwarted thief is then forced to leave with nothing. Now, he might think he's a bit of a joker, but we need you to name this sinister clown tonight. If you can name anyone featured in tonight's CCTV, let me give you that different number again. It's 02920-838-640. And, of course, all the information is on the website. Over the past 30 years, Crime Watch has featured 758 murders. It is, of course, the most devastating of crimes, but somehow throughout the years, families and friends have found the strength to talk to us about their grief and to appeal to help catch the killers. We usually speak to them in the immediate aftermath of their loss, but I wonder, have you ever wondered what happens next? How they survive the years and decades that follow once our cameras have moved on? I didn't feel that I wanted Lynn and Megan right close at hand. This beautiful spot is about 10 miles from where we live. 
notes so I don't have to be reminded constantly, but their memory intrudes every day. Something will, you know, bring them back to you. Your wife and children are cut down in a corn field on a sunny day in Kent, middle of nowhere, you know, last place you'd expect to to have something like that. And the circumstances, you know, not a, a fevered killing, but a sitting them down and blindfolding them and then beating them to death with a hammer. It's just incomprehensible. I was quite almost delirious and saying that there was no point in me going on there's nothing left in my life. There must be a quick and easy way out. But the moment I knew that Josie was alive, suddenly it changes everything. You think, right, you've got to be there for her. Sean's eldest daughter, Josie, had also been attacked, along with her mum and little sister. Josie had severe head injuries, but miraculously, she survived. I used to get people saying, oh, you're so brave, Josie, and or in the newspaper it said that, but I don't really understand why they say that, because I haven't done anything really that brave. <laughs> I've just got better. Josie is now 27 and is building a career as a textile artist. I like people to say to me that I'm a, oh, you're the famous artist, aren't you, Josie? And I like that. I'm not a famous artist, I'm just an artist making my ways in life and stuff. Um, but yeah, I definitely like people saying that now and not saying that, oh, I'm the, you're the little girl from the newspaper, so I don't like that anymore. If I say that I'm thinking of the future all the time and think positive, it doesn't mean that I am forgotten about the, haven't forgotten about the past. I do think about it and I think of the happy memories and things, but yeah, I don't like thinking about it too much or anything. Um, some people, some newspapers said that I'd forgotten stuff about the past or something, but I hadn't. Maybe I'd told them that, but I haven't at all or anything. So I know um, about how life used to be, but yeah, I have to think positive and don't dwell about it. Very good. good girl. She doesn't come across as a victim, but I don't like people to think that she's come out of it unscathed. You have to remember the toll that it took on her life and what might have happened otherwise. Michael Stone was convicted of murdering Lynn and Megan Russell and the attempted murder of Josie. He's serving three life sentences. I'm sure that I would be just as upset if I'd lost my family in a plane crash, but somehow I constantly think it needn't have happened. Someone has done this out of evil, out of total lack of empathy with, with a fellow human being. You're left grasping for something that's just not there and you're never gonna, you're never gonna find it really. Why did this happen? As a dad, I haven't got much left of Francesca's life and stuff, and I just keep all the things that um, record that she lived and, you know, actually what happened to her. But there's a lot of stuff that I keep in there. It's very difficult for me to read them, but I keep them there as an archive, and, you know, it'll probably always stay as an archive. Three-year-old Francesca died after an arson attack at her home in December 2008. The rest of the family escaped, but she was trapped inside. There's an overwhelming flashback all the time of, you know, the way the last image I have of Francesca, um, which affects me every day, you know, and it plays on my mind of the last time I've seen her and the devastation that she experienced as a three-year-old child. 
the, the, the things that you go asleep on, the first thing I wake up thinking about, I think about it all day and the last thing I go to bed thinking about. And I dream about it. In 2009, 44-year-old Graham Heaps was jailed for life for starting the fire which killed Francesca. If you come into this space, we have Francesca's star zone, which is a crash and soft play area and um, where children come from. Kieran has dedicated himself to the Francesca Bimson Foundation set up in his daughter's memory to provide support for other families affected by serious crime. You choose to live on. Everyone can give up. It's quite easy to just lose faith in humanity. And I did do that for a certain extent of time. But then you wake up and you say, what about my children that survived? And you owe it to your loved ones to live on. I've chose to keep my daughter alive through what I put in place. It, it's very poignant to be surrounded by the image of your daughter, but it's very comforting to know she's all around. So it's like an emotional blanket to surround yourself. Um, sometimes people might think it's suffocating. I think it's comforting. This is my daughter's playroom. As you can see, she's not short of uh, a thing or two. Um, she has some stuff in her bedroom as well. So she's um, well looked after, that's for sure, on the playing front. Um, yeah, and she has got all of this stuff because, you know, she's the absolute point of my life now. And I find it incredibly difficult to say no. Paul Bowman's six-year-old daughter is now the focus of his life. His other daughter, Sally Ann, was murdered in 2005, just weeks after her 18th birthday. I wouldn't say I'm overprotective. I try and be as normal as possible. It's, it's difficult because I do have a, an awful sort of thing in the back of my head that, uh, you know, my daughter will not get to adulthood as Sally didn't. You've been told that she's been grabbed by someone and stabbed to death. This is the last minutes of your, your daughter's life. Did she feel pain? How long did it take? Did she suffer? Did, you know, all, all those sorts of things. You know, who, who did it? Why? Where is he? I can be driving along, um, having quite a good day, and all of a sudden, bang, it would just enter my head, and it's as if I was there. In my, in my mind for, for a few seconds, it's as if I was there and just standing there and not being able to do anything. In 2008, 37-year-old Mark Dixie was found guilty of Sally Ann's murder and jailed for a minimum of 34 years. I went to the magistrate's court and I'm sitting in there and then I heard um, a lock opened, like a s big slide bolt, slide. But that came from downstairs. There was a set of stairs to my right-hand side. And then I heard footsteps on the stairs. And I knew that it was him coming up the stairs. And at any minute, we would actually be in the same room. And I've never felt anything like it in my life. It was ridiculous. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't see. I couldn't think. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know where I was. didn't know what I was doing. It was an absolute psychological breakdown. For Paul Bowman, the grief hit the hardest once his daughter's killer was convicted. I didn't want to survive. I didn't want to be here. I don't know whether I had not enough courage or, or what, but I, I couldn't actually commit suicide. But, um, but dying seems a, a, a really good thing to do. There was quite a bit of drinking going on. There was a fair amount of drug taking. There was a fair amount of involvement in very dodgy people. It was an absolute downward spiral. So I, I know that the drop down there was, was an immense, like falling off a cliff. But I, I just can't remember whether I climbed back up slowly or whether I bounded back up. I just, I just can't remember. I know I did, otherwise I wouldn't be here now. I don't speak with any kind of acceptance whatsoever because to me it's still horrific and it's still disgusting, but I can't allow it and him and his actions to destroy me anymore. I allowed him to do that for a while, but uh, I'm determined he, he, won't, he won't win this war with me. 
I will live a, as decent a life as I can with what's happened and what's in, in my head. Life doesn't end when we lose our loved ones. It should continue in honour of our loved ones. I just want to let people know how I am now and how normal I am and um, that my life is OK and happy. She definitely doesn't ever look back or want to talk about it or think about it. She just wants to get on with life and enjoy herself. So, yeah, I think we could all learn from that. Thank you to everyone who talked to us for that film for Crime Watch. Um, I should tell you just briefly that on the double rape case tonight, we think we've had a very uh, significant call from a key witness. We believe that Darren has called in. In fact, he is talking right now to one of our senior investigating officers. Apologies again for the problems with the phone lines. Please do call the new number. It's 02920-838-640. If you can help them, please do call in from everyone on Crime Watch. Your calls make a difference. We'll see you again next month. For now, bye-bye.